hearts are yearning for you. We long for you. It's when we see you, we find strength to face the day. And in your presence, all our fears are washed away. Been washed away. Hosanna, Hosanna, you are the God who saves us, you're worthy of all our praises, and Hosanna, Hosanna, come have your way among us, we welcome you here, Lord Jesus. Hear the sound of hearts returning to you. We turn to you. Because in your kingdom, broken lives are made new. You make us new. Because when we see you, we find strength to face the day. And in your presence, all our fears are washed away. They're washed away. Hosanna. Hosanna. You are the God who saves us you're worthy of all our praises and Hosanna Hosanna come have your way among us we welcome you here Lord Jesus and Hosanna Hosanna, you are the God who saves us, you're worthy of all our praises, and Hosanna, Hosanna, come have your way among us, we welcome you here, Lord Jesus. Lord, come have your way among us. We welcome you here, Lord Jesus. Paul, thanks very much for, for coming down. Can I just ask you a couple of questions to tell with, make sure the mics are on and working? So That's okay. Take one last so you can maybe make me out a wee bit clearer. Okay. Uh, Paul, do you prefer coffee or tea? Tea. Tea. And what would you do to, uh, if you had a, a spare hour, what would you be up to? Um, generally, at the minute, I like, I like doing a wee bit of exercise, stuff like that. You'll probably do that through my testimony. Just to be a bit of a health fanatic. Yeah. Very good. And how's the science, David? We're loud and clear. That's great. We'll start with our first question. Paul, tell us a little bit about what life was like for you growing up. Um, well, for me, life life started for me whenever I was born into a Gunnam hospital. My family's originally from Tyrone, uh, but we moved to Ballymena uh, whenever I was born, uh, or about a year after I was born. So that's how I came uh, to be in Ballymena. Life... Uh, for, for me, it was, it was very simple, plain. I was a quiet lad for most of my life. You know, but generally, I would be fairly quiet. Um, I come from my mum and dad and my brothers and sisters. There's 11 of us all together. Uh, born into a wee Catholic family. I shouldn't say we, but probably, probably one of the larger families. <laughs> but not the largest in Balamina. There used to be a family of 22 people in it. But 
that's a real family. But anyway, um, I, was, I, I must admit, we, we had a great family. We, you know, it was a good home. It was always love there. Mother was great. Um, father always provided for us. I mean, father spent a lot of time working, as you can imagine, trying to provide for a family of that size. Uh, but, you know, he, he, he really sort of worked hard most of his life and, and provided for us. Growing up as a, a young boy, as I said, I was generally a fairly quiet chap. Um, never, well, myself, we were, a, we were a family who would have went to church a lot. I can rarely say I ever missed a Sunday going to chapel or mass, whatever way you want to put it. Um, uh, as I grew up, I, we went to a wee, a wee school, a wee primary school. Um, it was an old boys' school at that time. Um, but unfortunately, I maybe wasn't the brightest child in the world. Because even whenever I left school, I could hardly still read or write. Um, but we left primary school. I went to St. Patrick's High School from Shane Road in Ballymena. There, it was, it was a wee bit stranger for me there. I suppose like most young people going into secondary school, it was a wee bit of a new challenge. It was a bigger place. Like there could have been over 800 uh, young people there you know, at school. You know, there was girls in our class, which we never experienced before. Boys from other places, Carnlock. Lock Gill, Clock Nulls, all of that, Dunloy, all around um, Ballymun area, of course. Um, so school was a bit of a challenge for me, especially at the beginning. But, you know, I can say honestly that most of us who went into the same class, we all generally get on fairly well with each other. Now, as I uh, started to grow up, I found that I maybe weren't, wasn't very good academically, but generally with sports, physical things, I was always fairly good at. So. As I grew up in my teenage years, sport became a very important part of my life. Uh, and as, as I said to you before, uh, I always do still do a wee bit of training, not as much as I used to, uh, but I, I always enjoyed sport. So much so that I used to play Gaelic football, I used to play badminton, I used to play five-a-side football. And then later on, I started martial arts. So with, with all of that, the God of my life was sport. I loved it so much. I mean, I would have trained seven days a week, sometimes twice a day, maybe sometimes three or four hours in a day, you know, going from various places to this or that or whatever. So go out. So the sport was a big part of my life growing up. Now, coming near the end of school, unfortunately, as I said before, I wasn't maybe very academical. But the reading was very poor. Um, and my writing, everything else just probably went the same way. I wasn't very intelligent that way, but... I was always good with my hands, so whenever I left school, I would kind of wondered what, what would I do with myself. But I, I would like to thought of being an electrician, but because of probably the exams and things like that, I've said God knew rightly, it wasn't really the, the place for me. So I went back to the tech, uh, trying to get a few exams. But as I was there, I got offered a, a place in the government training centre as a bricklayer. So I just took the opportunity at that time. I left after about six weeks, went to the government training centre, and there I started off. My apprenticeship, uh, trying to learn how to use a trowel, build walls, you know, things like that, how to use a level, uh, and just generally get comfortable with using tools and things like that. Now, as that time came to its end, I, you have to go out and look for a job you know, after maybe a year, year and a half, I think it was at that time. So I got a job with one of the local builders in Palomina, uh, where I spent my time, I served my time as a bricklayer. Um, there was a, another member of my family who was a bricklayer as well, so we would have worked at nights and things like that. That's how you would have... Uh, we just, just enjoyed the work, you know. One of them guys that kind of actually likes it, it enjoys his work, strange to say. I know there's many people out there who don't enjoy work, but I happen to be one of them strange people that does enjoy work. Um, anyway, at that time, at that time, I've come about 18 years of age. Uh, and for a young fella, what you generally do is you go out and about. You go out and enjoy life. Go out to the discos, bars, whatever. Not that I was a big drinker because I never was. I didn't really start drinking maybe till either later on, maybe into my twenties. Um, but socialising, I enjoyed the discos, the dancing, all that sort of thing. Not that I was any good at it, like, but I enjoyed it. Enjoyed the social aspect of it uh, with the friends, and then, of course, as you do, you, you end up meeting the girl, and that girl eventually became my wife. Um, anyway, in, in around that time. As I say, I used to play Gaelic football, so um, 
sometimes whenever we would come, come home from football matches, like from Tunbridge, I'm sure you most of you know Tunbridge, we would have been stopped by the army. And at that time, they used to get you out of the car. And I mean, sometimes I was a wee bit naive. Uh, you'd get you out of the car and they would sort of search you and try and basically make you look like an agent. You know, it would be quite easy for, for people to get drawn into, you know, into paramilitary or something. I was actually talking to my brother very recently about that. He said it's been so easy if we'd have lived around the two areas and things like that to be drawn into par paramilitaries. But thank God we didn't. And for those out there who think that every Catholic person is in the IRA, I don't believe it because it's not true. I was never in the IRA. None of my family have ever been in the IRA. So don't, I don't want you thinking that every Catholic person in the world in Northern Ireland is in the IRA because they're not. I'm thankful that we were sort of steered away from those sort of things. But anyway, as life was, uh, went on, I found that it was around 1989 that uh, I got laid off from my work. Uh, I would have been probably about 21, 22 years of age at this time, I think it was around about 1989, as I mentioned. And there I met a man. Sorry, just before that, maybe a few weeks before, we'd done, we'd done a wee bit of work with this man. He was a Christian. He was the first born again Christian I ever met, 22 years of age. Um, uh, through that, this man. Whenever he was with us, he was always talking about God. Never met a man that talked about God as much in life. A man who was very interested in God, always talked about God, knew the scriptures well. Unbelievable, uh, 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 what do you would say, unbelievable you know, knowledge of the scriptures. You could have taken him to any, if you'd have read the wee portion of scripture in the Bible and said, and read it out, he would have been able to tell you verse and chapter. That's how well he knew the scriptures. He loved God. He's always talking about God. But anyway, just shortly after that, um, I, as I said, I got laid off from my work. And an opportunity came up for this man. James, his mate, actually had taken a heart attack around that time, so we needed somebody to work with. So I started to work with him. And the more I worked with him, James, James as I explained, James was always talking about God, and the Bible, you know, uh, how you needed to be saved, salvation, what it meant, who Jesus was, and talked about things in the scriptures in the Old Testament, New Testament, half the stuff I'd never heard of before. Like generally, whenever you go to Mass, you, you'd have maybe been a little reading. Through that reading, would have been the same thing, like, but kind of like a yearly thing I just kept taking. You never really learned a big lot, if you know what I mean. Not that I maybe had the desire to learn a big lot, but uh, again, James asked me one day, he says, he says, are you going to go to heaven? And I sort of looked at him and says, well, you know, because you're a churchy person, you like to think that one day you'll be in heaven. I said, I'd like to think so, but uh, I wasn't sure. He says, have you ever read the Bible? I says, well, my father would have collected old, old antique Bibles at times, and he might have had an old flick through it. But generally, you know, I never read the Bible. That was the only Bible that probably ever was in our home, but nobody kind of read the Bibles in our home. Uh, I'm not saying that's the same for every Catholic person, by the way, but it just happened to be that's what it was like in our home. Um, so that's when I see the first miracle in my life. I had a Bible the next day, and I never asked for it, and I never paid for it. It was given to me as a gift. So from that time on, I thought to myself, like, what am I, where am I going to put this? What am I going to do? So I kept it in the car. So whenever I went to work, uh, I would have brought it out at the lunch breaks and started to read it. Right, each lunch break every day. Uh, and then if I'd have come across wee problems, I would say to James, what does this mean or what does that mean? And James, vice versa, whenever you come from Mass, he would ask you, uh, what did the priest say today? You know, he's always trying to, if you're trying to talk to maybe Catholic people, ask him what the priest said. And maybe you could get a wee conversation that way. He always did it with me, and I never maybe just realised it at the time, but it was actually a great way of opening up the scriptures. Um, so I read, I started to read the Bible, and I started reading, again, as most people do just from the beginning, Matthew, read through the Gospel, right through Revelation. And then I started in the Old Testament, finished the Old Testament, and then I started again, just kept going on for a year. I'd done that for years. Now, not that I'm a great person for, I can take the chapter and verse or anything like that, but I have a, a reasonable understanding of the scriptures. But then James mentioned to me one time about, uh, about a testimony. And I says, uh, what do you mean by a testimony? He says, really, it's for somebody will share, just what I'm doing tonight, share their life, their life story. Maybe how God uh, maybe brought somebody into your life. 
that shared the gospel with you, whatever, and uh, maybe through that, that you, know, you get saved. And that's kind of what happened. God chose James, uh, who was a great blessing in my life. Uh, taught me many things. I mean, whenever I read the scripture, I, I read, for instance, like, the Lord of brothers and sisters, and I was going, what? I never knew. I always thought the Lord Jesus was an only child. Um, you know, but salvation, you need to be saved. This idea of, you know, the word saved means to be rescued. I never understood things like that. But it's only as I've come to start reading the Bible, I understand the degree of the scriptures. And, uh, so, and I we got an opportunity. At this time, my wife, uh, probably around this time, my wife has started going back to church again because where she worked at, uh, we shot in Ballymena called Style of Sport. If Sammy would have been a Christian, and so was Stanley Kyle. Uh, Stanley Kyle would be in Belfast City Mission now and our old ministries. Um, but anyway, through that, she started getting an interest in going back to church and stuff like that, you know, and starting to read the Bible. That's where the, the Bible things come about. Uh, well, Stanley, he um, got a, a few fellas from the hospital, got a, a Catholic man to come up and give us testimony on that thing. He was from Galway. And uh, he shared how the Lord saved him, uh, you know, how he met the Lord Jesus and what he was doing in his life and all that. You know, I went in, the way I came in is the way I went out. It never changed me. Anything. Maybe there's somebody in here tonight and you've come in and you go out, there's never any change. You know, that was what I was like. You know, I had little experience, you see, because I didn't really understand. A few months later, I think it was about another six months later, I was invited to a youth fellowship meeting again. Uh, probably one of the oldest ones actually in the meeting, if you know what I mean. I, was, I think it was nearly uh, 22, 12, 23 maybe at that time. Uh, and there, this man, Vincent Gannon, come up from Dublin. Uh, Vincent Gannon come up from Dublin. Again, a man who again shared his testimony of what the Lord did in his life, and uh, he was a man who lived by faith. Um, I don't know where some of you know him, you might know him, or I'm not sure. But uh, we went back to Stanley's house that evening, and as we went back, we just kept talking about the scriptures and all the rest. And then he just asked me a question. He says, "He says, would you like to be saved?" And I thought about it, you know, but there was a kind of like a darkness come on, come on, in, in my presence at that time, and I wasn't sure what to do or what to say. But I said yes. You see, because whenever I was reading the scriptures, the Lord was drawing me to the scriptures every day, and, and I love to read the scriptures. What else could I do but come to Jesus Christ? And I get saved that night, the 26th of November, 1989. I am a believer now, 32 years, and the Lord's been really good uh, in my life, and He's really blessed me uh, at that time. So that's how I came to know the Lord. Those early days, sort of. Uh, just after you've been saved, tell us a little bit about that. What, what was that like? Uh, did you go into a church or what? Well, I, I started going to the Presbyterian Church at that time um, uh, in Brookside in the Hockle. Uh, great, great wee bunch of people uh, that taught so much from the Reverend Ivan McKay and more recently William Murray. Um, great fellowship, lovely people, uh, really encouraged me uh, and work. I don't know what else to say just about that, but I was encouraged. Certainly, I mean, there were certain things happened in my home at that time. I mean, I never told anybody that I was saved at that time because I wanted to see if I could keep it. But you soon realize in the Christian life, it's not you who does the keeping, it's the Lord that does the keeping. It's the Lord that kept me. And, uh, you know, come to the point, how do you tell your parents you know, you're saved? Uh, that wasn't an easy thing either, but I'm glad to say that there was an opportunity to come up my brother's home one evening, my brother could see a change in me. Uh, he said to me, there's something different about you. He says, uh, he says, a bit, are you one of sort of born again believers now, are you? See, he could see the change in my life. Maybe I couldn't see it the same. You see, the language is different. Uh, just maybe my whole persona was different. Uh, but he could see something different in me. That's wonderful just to think how God can have that effect on a person, how, you, how they can change him. Maybe tonight you're here. And there's things in your life you're maybe not happy with. But when you come to Jesus, Jesus will make change in your life. And people will see the change in it. And you'll know, know it for the better. Now, my family came to know me. My family weren't maybe best pleased at me becoming a Christian. Because if you can think about it, they, they look upon you in a sense like a traitor. Because you've, you've let down the faith, the, the Roman Catholic faith. Although I didn't see it again, I just see it as one who came to believe in Jesus Christ. And... It's like John 3 and 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever, I was the whosoever, the Paul, the man, 
you could be Seamus, Liam, Billy, it doesn't matter what your name is, you put your name in as a whosoever will, will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. I get saved that night because of what Jesus did the cross at Calvary. Thank God for that. Maybe just an information you could say about how God has impacted your life in more recently. Well, in more recent years, because of COVID-19, most of these have been impacted some way. And unfortunately, at that time, the church is closed. And to me, I thought to myself, churches shouldn't be closed. The churches should have stayed open. And I mean that. Unfortunately, whenever I look at Psalm 1, I, I look at Psalm 1 and it says, do not listen to the counsel of the ungodly. You know, whenever David, whenever he was in the cave, I think it was a Dullam, whenever troubles came, he called for the minister and the priest and he called for the ark and things like that. And he sought the Lord. Unfortunately, most people didn't seek the Lord in this decision. They listened to the government, the ungodly. And I was very disheartened by that, so I was. So, but that time, um, I'm going to take you back maybe six years ago. My son uh, wasn't very well. Uh, like some people today, they get bothered with uh, anxiety and depression. My son, I think of 15 years of age, was bothered with this. It really uh, impacted his life at that time. Now, we noticed a wee bit of a change in him. Um, he was about 15, he was going to school. And, you know, he just seemed so disinterested. He didn't want to go to school. He didn't want to do his exams, anything like that. We were like, what's going on here? What's happening? And we found out he was, getting, he was depressed. Uh, depression came in and was starting to take havoc in his life for some reason. We weren't really sure why. But at that time, he started uh, looking through the internet to try and sense make himself better again. But unfortunately, he got involved in the occult, um, whereby uh, there was at times at night he said that you know, whenever he was lying in the bed, he felt as if there was a demon at the end of his bed trying to pull him out of bed as if to take him to hell. Uh, that was how it was affecting him. Uh, it was about maybe uh, about five years ago, he came to me one night. He said, Dad, how did I get saved? And he said to me, I said, son, you know how you get saved. I said, I said you've heard it from a child about the Lord Jesus, how you need to repent, believe, and be baptized. You, know, you need to believe in Jesus Christ. You need to repent of your sin and give your life to Jesus Christ. Then he'll come in and save me. So unbeknown to me that night, Thomas actually, uh, actually gave his life to the Lord. And he explained it to me this way, that he just felt such a great release, as if something had just literally come out of his head. As they thought it was a, a, a possession from a spirit or something. I'm not sure. The way he kind of explained it to me, that's nearly what it sounded like. Like most people, whenever they get saved, he's talking to this pressure and lifted off their shoulders. But for him, there's something come out of his head. And the, the demons out there are real, folks. You know, I, I was kind of one of these people, maybe like yourself, I don't believe in them sort of thing. Well, not really. It doesn't happen in our day. But obviously it does because the occult is out there. And they're very dangerous. Well, anyway. Thomas, uh, uh, we, we get introduced to, to Richard Bell, the wee tabernacle where I go to now. Richard actually came to our home at that time, about five years ago, and he, he came up and talked to, to Thomas, and he said to him, Thomas, there's things in your life you need to change before we can help you. So Thomas changed a few things, and then Ricky came round to our home and prayed with him. And I thought, so he went up into our son's room, and he talked to him, and then he started to pray. Now this man literally was shouting at the top of our room, and going, what the heck's wrong with that man? Is he, why does he need to shout? Is there something wrong with him? Is there something, does he think God's deaf? That's how I perceive this man. You know, he's, he's, a great, he's a great voice in our town at the minute for, for those of the alcoholics, the demon possession, broken marriages. You know, and I love him and the Lord, I really can say that tonight. He came into our home like, and for, at that time, say, Thomas could save maybe a few months after that. Thomas, he started going to the tabernacle at that time. Uh, and at that time, just to encourage him, I started going with him maybe to an old prayer meeting, maybe a Sunday evening service if it wasn't on the home church. And he said to me, Dad, you know, maybe the Lord's speaking to you, maybe you need to start coming here. I said, son, I'm quite happy where I'm at. I've been going to Brookside for nearly 30 years probably last year. I'm, I'm happy enough where I'm at, you know. Uh, the Lord hasn't told me to go anywhere. But anyway, as you know, COVID came in nearly almost two years ago. As I say, I was kind of a wee bit disheartened by that, so I started going to the wee tavern. I got never closed the whole time. Praise God for that, actually. There was ministering done there. Uh, there was prayer meetings. We prayed for the, the town and our families, uh, for all the situations in Northern Ireland. Uh, 
praying that God would make a move. That God's really blessed that wee place he really has. Uh, there's over 30 souls have come to the Lord this year alone. Backsliders, you know, brought back to the Lord. Unbelievable. The food bank. Even today, just, you know, I was in actually giving a testimony on today as well online. And today there was actually five food parcels actually went out to wee families today in Balanair. Over the Christmas period, over 120 hammers went out. And I had the privilege of going around and, and being able to go out and share them out at the Christmas time there. Such a blessing. I mean, the Lord's really been good. Um, but a, f- a few months ago, uh, I think it was around March time last year, I, I made a decision. I said, Lord, if you want me to go come here, he says, you're going to have to show me scripture. They show me Joshua chapter 9 and verse 1. I just want to just read it to you if I can. And you all know that scripture is all fairly well uh, written in the book. And it says, have I not commanded you that you be strong and of good courage? Be not afraid. Neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whether so wherever thou goest. And I found that was a, a wee scripture the Lord gave me, and that's what I was looking for. And then another one came along and says, the Lord is going to do new things, you know, in your life. And since we've been coming to the wee tabernacle, I started coming in October, I went back to we Presbyterian Church and just said, look, my wife and my, my wife and myself are now going to uh, the tabernacle. We just we came here to say goodbye and we thank you very much for, for all your blessings throughout the year, but we're just moving on now. Even since then, like the Lord's really been touching. You know, we had a wee tent mission this August again this year, like and, you know, again while all the places were shut, we had a wee tent mission, you know, and four people get saved at it. Just like you mentioned here, like a couple of three people have already got saved. There's people online get saved listening to the meetings. You know, it's really been tremendous, like what the Lord's doing and that we that we done, you know. It's tremendous really is. Well thanks very much for, for coming down and thank you very much for having me. Is there anything else you want to, to share or Well, it's just you know, if you're out there tonight and uh, maybe God is speaking to you, the Bible tells us now is the day of salvation. And if you if you're listening tonight and maybe the Lord's been speaking to you, why not ask the Lord Jesus, look at that wee verse in John three and sixteen, but God so loved the world. God loved you so much that he sent the best thing he had to save you. Jesus was the key to salvation. He is our refuge and our strength. So he is tonight. And maybe you're thinking, like, how do I do it? It's the whosoever. Put your name for the whosoever is. Call on his name tonight and he will save you. God bless you and I hope you do that tonight. In Jesus' name. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. song just starts off it says I searched the world but couldn't tell man's empty trays and treasures that be it never so I, I don't know what you've tried uh, maybe you, you've tried most things uh, it, it could be a whole host of things uh, maybe sitting at home uh, you you would say I, I've tried nearly anything I can think of in the world and it hasn't worked in fact I'm probably worse off than I was when I started but we want to tell you about hope in Jesus. Hope in Jesus because the weak chorus says that there's nothing better than you. Nothing better than you. And the bridge goes on and, and it talks about uh, it's just God turning it around. And, and, and our hope and our prayer is that God would turn it around for you tonight. And it could happen tonight. God could turn your life right around in an instant. In and in a simple, honest prayer. Um, I, I actually believe that God would, would rather hear just an honest, stumbling prayer than one that's all scripted out, than one that's all hyped up. Uh, we don't all have a Damascus Road experience. Sometimes it could just be a simple, simple wee prayer. God save me. Simple and honest. And God could turn it all around. So I want to sing this wee song. It's entitled Graves into Gardens. Because God turns things around. And if you've tried and you've searched and nothing's worked, maybe tonight's your night for Jesus. I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. And mine's empty praise and treasures that fade. 
are never enough. But then you came along. You put me back together. Now every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing that's better than you. There's nothing that's better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Oh, nothing is better than you. I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and faults. Lord, you see them all, yet you still call me friend. And the God of the mountain is the God in the valley. And there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again oh there's nothing that's better than you lord there's nothing that's better than you oh there's nothing oh nothing is better than that lovely there's nothing better than the Lord Jesus it's not right a smile or do something oh seriously never saw the like of it in all my life listen you see knowing Jesus Christ did you hear what Johnny said there is nothing better than this hallelujah there's a young Chelsea fan sitting there the night how he got into this place when we're all Man United supporters is beyond me it's great to be saved, honestly. It's great to be saved. Listen, I want to tell you something tonight, folks. If you've come here tonight for a big religious service and a big religious sermon, you better go on home. You're not going to get it in here. But what you're going to get tonight is a group of folk that love you. Love you. And I mean that with all of my heart. We love you. I don't care what you've done. I don't care how far you have fallen. I don't care if you drink yourself silly. We love you. But I want to tell you there's someone who loves you even more. And his name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. He loves you so much. And I want you to set aside everything tonight. Castle Ray Community Church, will you forget about it? It'll do you no good. I mean that reverently, Castle Ray. You know what I mean. You don't need to come here. I want you to forget about the Presbyterian, the Church of Ireland, the chapel. You don't need to come. I want you to fall in love and I can get to a place called Calvary. Get there. 
I am thrilled that your prayers have been answered and three folk have trusted Jesus and we're only on Thursday night. I'm thrilled. Lives transformed. Can I share a story? She's maybe on. Forgive me if you think I'm bad with my nerves because I'm crying. I'm not. I cry because I've got a love in here for broken people. Marriages that are falling apart. We alcoholics have, have had brokenness in their lives so they think they'll turn to the drink to mask it all. There was a young girl tuned in on Monday night. She tuned in. She actually sent, she told me the wee lady, but it was Stevie. He's not a wee lady, he's a boy. I'm sure of it, it's hard to know in this generation what is what's what. <laughs> She got in touch with us, not going into her personal life, that's personal. She wasn't given much hope from the church outside. She watched on Monday night. I had the privilege of leading her to the Lord today on the phone at 12 30 or 32 or something. She sent a message, you cast her right book. I hope you got it because she wanted you to know. I sent it to Stevie. Do you know what she said? She was, she was about to give up. Be young child, single parent. Do you know what she said? I haven't stopped smiling. Can't stop smiling. Because Jesus done something. Jesus done something. I have very cautiously came before God, like all preachers should do when they're preaching. And I have sought God for a message every single night for this place. I have never asked anybody about backgrounds or stuff for tell me wee bits and pieces. I've never done that. Because then that means you see a preacher could be influenced just to give a message to suit the audience. I don't do that. And if this penetrates your heart tonight, I don't know half ends. Then I know God wants to speak to you. Because I'm convinced of this. 25 past four this morning, Tell her not mind me saying that she's not here. I'll know if my sleeping bag's at the door when I go home. She, she was watching and she doesn't like me anymore. Tell her snores like a ball game. But I think it's the cutest thing I've ever saw. I mean that. She knows that. I was lying at just 20 past four this morning. And God give me this message for the night. Because I'm convinced that there's somebody broken in here the night. Badly, badly broken. You don't know where to go, what to do. You don't know who to turn to. And I'm coming tonight because you know I've been trying to give you five, you, you know that if you've been coming. I've been trying to give you five things every night on your hand or, or, or whatever, you know, or just to remember. Monday night, Jesus Christ, the only substitute. Jesus Christ, the only substitute. Tuesday night. You remember it? Do you remember it? Who gave himself for me. Wednesday night, last night. Therefore, be you also ready. Right. So you can remember it. I'm going to do nothing different tonight. You know I'm saved, don't you? I've got my Bible. I'm going to quote you. I'm not, I want to change it here because it's just what's been said tonight and what Johnny's medicine. John Howe stood in this platform on Sunday morning. John Howe. He stood in this platform and he quoted an amazing verse that I love. John 10.10. 10. The thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I have come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. That's what the King James Version says. Now, can I be really bold and give you an even better version? Remember this, folks. God didn't write the King James Version. I want to crack you in that. Most people think that God wrote the King James Version, and it's the only one out there. God didn't write it. There's discrepancies, and I can prove it to you in that. I use it, by the way, so don't think I'm hammering it. I use it. I love it. But there's few discrepancies. Let me quote you the English Version. Here's what it says. The thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy... But I have come in order that you will have life 
and life to the full. There it is. Do you get it? And life to the full. And I'm just going to, it's as if you're in my house tonight. Do you understand that? It's as if you're in my house and I'm having a wee chat with you. That's what I want. I want to get to know you. You're looking at a broken guy. You know, you're looking at a broken guy. So badly broken. So badly broken beyond belief. And I want you tonight to think of that as I speak to you. Do you remember? Say it back to me because some of you are looking at me as if I've got 90 heads. Say it back to me. What did I just give you? The five words. Thank you, Johnny. Shout it out. Right, can you say it with me? At least let the people know that at least there's an audience and I'm not standing here talking to no one. Say it to me. And life to the full. That's it tonight. God wants you to have a full life. He wants you to have a full life. The devil wants you to have a crap life, a rubbish life, a boring life, an awful life. He wants that. So I'm going to speak to you tonight very, very briefly. It's going to be so simple. I mean it. Even you boys will understand an old boy from the sticks. Not an old Belfast boy. You know what I mean? You'll understand me. Listen. Here's what James 4.14 says. What is your life? But I've given you the five words. What are they again? Okay, so you get what James is saying. What is your life? In other words, if you were in Belfast, and I love it. I, I'm like Ricky Bell. Ricky and I is great friends. I love the streets. If you were in Belfast tonight, they wouldn't say, what is your life? The most of them wouldn't say that. Here's what they'd say. What's the crack, mocker? You understand? That's what they would say. Or, if you're up my country, what about Isham? Do you understand? That's what they say. Listen, let's not all be religious. Can we just be normal? Can we just be normal people? I said in this pulpit last night, God is tired of religion. Scundered. What he wants is reality. I just want to simply ask you tonight, what is your life? And I'm going to go through the scriptures, because we have to base everything in the scriptures. You see, you can't just come and talk about fairy story. You've got to base it in the scriptures. I'm going to suggest to you some things tonight that your life could be like. And you see if you fit into them, will you? You just see if you fit into them. Now, be honest. I was saying to Paul, me and Paul were sitting there. Was it me and you, Paul? It wasn't me and you. Maybe on the way down the shower. There's no point you pretending that you're something you're not, because guess what? God already knows. There's no point you hoodwinking anybody. So here's the first thing. What is your life? You ready for it? Your life could be full of drunkenness. Do you know how many people outside Castle Grey building tonight are drowning their hurt and their pain with the bottle? Thousands of them. Thousands. And you see, something has happened along the way. Because when I work with people, as do anyone that works in ministry, they should. When you work with broken people, you will always discover that there's a root. There's a root cause of why we do what we do. Why do we turn to drink? Why do we turn to pornography? Why do we abuse? Why do we do all this? And you've got to get to the root. Because you need to deal with that root. Maybe I'm speaking to someone in here tonight. And you love the bottle, boy. You love the bottle. Eh? And, and maybe you don't have just enough money to get the Jack Daniels or the Bushmills whiskey, but you do have enough money to buy the odd bottle of Buckfast or, or the odd wee cheap vodka. You've got the money for that because you want to mask something deep within you that is hurting a broken marriage. Children that don't love you anymore or so you think. A wife that's left you. A husband that's gone up the road. And so you want to try and mask the pain. And maybe tonight if I was to ask you, what is your life? You would say to me, Mark, that's me. Drunkenness. Drunk. I just love getting drunk. And in case you think I'm preaching at you, can I turn it back on me then? Guess what I love? 
Let me tell you. Levin's night bonfire. Boys, I loved it. Levin's night bonfire, hey. Brilliant. And you would have just got involved in everything. But do you know what it was? Band parades. Do you know why you went for a band parade? You were drunk going to it. You were drunk when you were marching. And you were drunk coming home. You see, the problem was that you were trying just to, to, to nearly escape yourself. I'm going to take you to the Bible. What is your life? Is it marked with drunkenness? Let me take you to a man. Where do you hear this? Daniel 5. Here's what it says. I'll paint you the picture. You look us all up when you go home because we have, we're in a time limit here in Castlereagh. Here's what it says. Belshazzar the king made a great feast for a thousand of his lords. Now, powerful. Imagine a thousand turning up for a big party. You heard about Paul the night. Couldn't dance to save himself. You see, parties were in the Bible. Parties are still going on the night. Belshazzar makes this great feast. Guess what it says? The wine was flowing. Can I just put it into modern day language for you? It was a drunken orgy. It's all right. If you're offended by that, it's all right. That's what it was. And the drink's flowing. The drink's flowing. And then Belshazzar, guess what he says? Hey, do you remember them things, them, them goblets, them gold and silver vessels that my grandfather Nebuchadnezzar brought out of the, the temple? You know where them Jewish people were? And he brought them, bring them out and we'll drink out of them. Sacred things. I want you to picture the scene now. Party. Beer. Woman. Everything. Just like the world today. Here it is. Can I tell you what? You know my heart anyway, and I'm just going to speak it. Uh, you're young. Close your ears for 10 seconds. I'm only joking. Your mummy will date me at the door. Can I tell you one of the biggest curses that our young people have now? And, and we're doing it as adults. We're giving them mobile phones from nine years of age. And they're running away and typing in stuff in that they shouldn't be looking at. And they're joining forums. Do you understand that there's forums out there where people can go on? There's even a self-harming forum where you can go on and you can cut life. Wake up. You can cut life and then they can connect with someone else and, and they show their wound and they show their wound and it's all part of the world. And guess what the church is doing? Fast asleep. Fast asleep. Sure, we'll close it for two years. But we'll keep open the off license. What? What? Listen, well, Chazer the king made a great feast for a thousand of his lords. He's having the beer and he thinks the party's going on forever. Well, he thinks it's class. Then something happens. Over against the candlestick, the finger of a man's hand starts writing in the wall. Can you imagine if that happened at a party you were at? Just the finger of a man's hand starts writing on the plaster. Here's what it says. Many, many people you farsen. That's what it says. Not one of the astrologers in the kingdom could work it out, but they knew there was a man called Daniel. They brought Daniel in and Daniel read it and he says, here's what it is. Wed, divided, found one thing. In other words, let me put it simple to you. You've had your drunken orgy. You've drank to your nearly silly in the head. But God's coming now. Your time's up. Do you know what it says in Daniel 5? In that very night, Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was killed. I want to be honest with you. Please listen to my heart tonight. If I get emotional, I'm making no apology about it. I believe there's somebody in here who can drink. And I'm not judging you. I am not judging you. I'm loving you. I'm telling you that there's a God who loves you. Because I want to tell you something that blows my mind. See, when you go to Luke 16, here's what it says. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment. It's an unbelievable story. When I read that, I could preach in that. I'm not going to do it in this mission. I, don't think. I could preach in that. But there's two words in Luke 16 that absolutely blew my mind. And when he's telling the story about the rich man that fared sumptuously every day, waking him up in hell, and he calls for a drop of water, you know that, a drop of water. The coolest tongue friend, tremendous in this flame. Do you know what the two words that come back to him? See here, you ready? 
as we, we skip over these as Christians, here's the two words that come back. Son, remember. Son, remember. I want to tell you if you're, if you're drinking heavily in the night in this place, now listen to me. See the very thing that you crave on a daily basis. See, if you die without Jesus Christ, you will crave that for all eternity. That thing you love, that one we drink, you will crave that in your mind. Can you imagine how that must feel? Seriously. To look Buckfast, to look WKD, to look Jack Daniels, to look Whiskey, to look Patchen, to look whatever you want to look, and it's not coming. Son, remember. Remember. Moving on. What is your life? Drunkenness. Quickly. I want to touch on this. I didn't even know. That. Did I know your story before you took the pulpit the night, brother? Never. I said to him in the van, crack, Paul, don't tell me your story. I want to hear it tonight fresh. I hate being interfered with when you're trying to preach a sermon or a message. I, said, I want to speak on this for a minute. What is your life? Drunkenness? What is your life? Depression. Mark, can you speak from experience on that? Or are you just speaking like another minister guy? I have a sister that has tried to kill herself on countless occasions. I have a mother-in-law that has tried to kill herself on countless occasions. I shared the other night that for 20 plus years, I had sexual abuse. I was sexually abused the paramilitaries and I buried it for 20 years and I wondered why I was taking panic attacks periodically I wonder why I was taking anxiety attacks periodically do you understand what I'm saying there was a route that will be come out that will be that one I want to speak to you tonight about depression and see if you ever get a Christian that tells you or any person that tells you to give yourself a kick up the backside you ring me I still know a few boys in East Belfast Brigade I'm joking by the way yeah just in case. Probably get about 100 emails now. Oh, I'm not that the And anyway, listen. Listen to me. Listen, stay sure. Depression's as real as cancer. It's far worse. And, that, I, and how, how can you say that, Mark? Well, I've been fighting cancer. So I think I've the right to say it. See, when I look at a wee person, are we man or are we woman? Are you a person? Like his dear brother's son. And I've spoke to his dear wife when I was preaching at Ricky's on Sunday. And I look at them. And I can see the dark cloud of depression hanging over them. All I know is that you might have life to the full. You think God wants you to feel like that. But the enemy does. I want to take you to the Bible very quickly. We're doing so well. I'll leave a few out. I'll leave a few out. We're doing so well. I want to take you to the Bible. I want to take you to 1 Kings 18, 19. Go you home and read it tonight. Whatever version you get, you read it. 1 Kings 18. Elijah is on top of Mount Carmel. 450 prophets of Baal. 400 prophets of the Asherah groves. Can you imagine? 850 prophets. And Elijah, one godly man, is standing alone. I said to Ricky Bell last night, this dear man's friend, my friend, he rang me at after 11 o'clock last night with a great chat. There's coming a day, I believe it, when God's people are going to have to stand alone. Tell you. Tell you. Forget about coming now and with your doctrines. Forget about coming with your, oh, forget about all that. Coming a day when you're going to have to stand alone now. Elijah stands alone against the prophets of Baal, but I want to take you, imagine he's facing 850 of them. I want to take you to the very next chapter. The man that stood alone against the prophets of Baal. Do you know in 1 Kings 19 where he is? He's sitting under a juniper tree. Here's what he says. Take my life, I've had enough. How can he go from the victory to the depths of despair? Well, it was one woman, and I'm not saying you woman are to blame for everything now, so don't be pulling me up at the door. It was one woman called Jezebel. He could face 850 prophets, but one woman just speaking caused him to sink into depression. I want to tell you tonight, what is your life? Maybe you're depressed. 
Maybe you're in Circular Line. Maybe you're in Fleox Team. Maybe you're, you're in something tonight, boy, and you're just trying to mask the whole thing because you're dealing with a hurt that no one even knows, and you cry yourself to sleep in bed at night. You just wish someone could take the pain away. I've been there. I've been there. I want to tell you tonight that there is a pain taker. There is a way maker. There is a miracle worker. And his name is Jesus. What is your life? Drunkenness? Depression? Concluding, I'm going to finish pretty good. I've caught a few out tonight. You young people, are you at school, darling? You back at school? You tell your mommy, pick the morrow off. You know the way you have to tell the teacher an excuse for being, you just write in your note, darling. You, you write this. Went to a mission. Preacher preached to midnight. Ready? What is your life? Drunkenness? Depression? Let me conclude with us. What is your life? Decisions. I read this today in the Hope Center. I don't know how Pilate must have felt. As he stood looking into the face of Christ. Looked at him now. And here's what he said in Matthew 27, 22. I'll give you the reference. Matthew 27, 22. Here's what he said. What will I do then with Jesus, who is called Christ? What will I do? Well, I'm going to change that question. Can I? I'm going to change that question. I'm not asking you what you will do with Jesus Christ, because you see, I am a firm believer in this. Christians get this. The best preachers, and we were talking about some of them last night, I can't remember, it was maybe me and Heather Johnson. The best preachers, and I sat under some of them, J.G. Hutchison, Albert McShane, I've named them before. Some of the best preachers I've ever heard, the Reverend William McRae, just got it out there, for he's one of my favorites. I've sat under the best preachers, and I've heard people come out saying, boys, how did they sit them people sit down to that meeting tonight? Have you ever heard people say that? How did they sit under that tonight? I don't mean to tell you why. Read the Bible. The God of this world has blinded their minds. You see, this salvation business is a work of God. It's God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, has to come and work in your life. I could preach to them tomorrow morning. You might never get it, unless God comes. So I'm going to turn the question around as I close. What will I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? Pilate asked. I'm going to ask this. What's Jesus Christ going to do with you? What's he going to do with you? I'm going to quote Jim Hutchison. Hell, I'm not mine. It just came to me. I remember him. Lovely man. We were talking last night. Do you remember him? Who, who remembers J.G. Hutchison? Beautiful man. Do you remember? Not a hair out of place. Silver grey suit. White shirt. He must have got one fresh out of Marks and Spencer's every time he preached. It was always, I couldn't believe it. Was a tie. It wasn't just an ordinary only nut that J.G. wore. It was a Windsor nut. I just want you to know that. I'm going to do it. Cookstown Gospel Hall, he looked over the pulpit one night, he had a lovely voice. He said this, what will you do with Jesus? Neutral, you cannot be. One day, you'll be asking, what will he do with me? I'm sorry, I feel it this night. Maybe you Christians don't feel it. Can I say to you Christians that are in here tonight, please take this in love. Would you take it in love? You know I'm not a hard preacher. You maybe think, Anna, if you do, I'm sorry. But see if you Christians in here tonight are never moved with compassion in your heart for unsaved people. You need to make sure you're genuinely saved to begin with. I'm serious. If you never shed a tear for people that are broken, you need to ask yourself, have I got it myself? Because when Jesus saw the people, he was moved with compassion. And I want to look at your face. Can I look at you? I don't even know you, sir. I'm not going to single you out. Don't worry. Don't please. I'm just looking at you from here to my dear friend Nelson at the back. I do it. Looking at you all. Brother Hugh. I love Brother Hugh. I'm looking at you all. Darling, tonight, have your mommy beside you. She's lovely. Don't know her. You don't know me either. 
I'm looking at you tonight. I've been looking at you since I come in. I feel you're broken. I do. I feel God wants to do something with you. I feel it. Ask you tonight from Johnny, my dear friend. It's wonderful how we have even renewed again after the years. I get that boy to take a mission. Remember, Johnny Lennox and Tommy Fields will put up a tent. Nanny, 12 years. Hard to believe. I'm looking at you all, I don't know some of you, some of you have got to know. Tell me. Tell me. What's Jesus going to do with you? Is he going to save you tonight and rescue you? Rescue you from drunkenness, from depression, from yourself? Are you going to stand in Revelation 20 at the great white throne? And he'll look at you now. Promise you. He'll look at you. Online, he'll look at you. I'm going to speak to you. He'll look at you. He'll say this. Look at my hands and see. I bore the nails for thee. I died to set you free. Why wouldn't you come? See so what the Bible says. Revelation 20, 15, it makes me tremble. And whoever was not found written in the book of life. Now let me change the word. See what your English Bible says. Was cast. Let me give you the word. The word's bolo in the original text. Do you know what it means? Whoever was not found written in the book of life was hurled into the lake of fire. You might think, oh, boy, that's a cruel Jesus Christ. Well, he's not. Because I've tried my best tonight. Should I never preach another message? <laughs> I've felt this more than anything. I don't know why. Should I never preach another message? Can you just tell me the name, Paul or Paul? Have I been faithful? I've warned you. Something in my heart tells me that some of you are getting your last chance tonight. I'm serious. I'm not scaring, not scaring you. I felt it. Otherwise, I wouldn't say it. Father, let's pray. Father, Father, there's broken people in this room tonight, Father. There's broken people online, I know it. There's young people in this room tonight that need Jesus. There's a man in here that loves the bottle even more than his own life. I know it. I feel it. There's a young lady in here tonight whose life has been falling apart around her and she's trying to rescue him. Jesus, I'm just simply asking, will you come and rescue that young lady tonight? You rescue her. Father, we love you tonight. Jesus, we love you. Pray for, boys, can I pray for you? Can I pray for your sons? Is that okay? What's your name, boys? You boys here. James? James? Harry? Tom, I've never met you before in my life. You folk in Castle Ray, you're maybe not used to what I'm about to do, but I hope you can do it. I want, see this young lady, your daughter, those Christians, those of you that know Jesus Christ, can you just lift your hand towards this young girl? Please, I know you're maybe not used to this. Please do it. Just this young girl. You folk on this side. No, no, you folk on this side. You're lifting them towards the boys. Do you understand that very soon in our curriculum, transgender, same sex, change, you can become what you want that's going to impact these young people. So I'm going to pray with them now. Please lift your hands towards them if you're a Christian, if you're saved, if you're God's people. Father, tonight I pray blessing on these three lads. 
James, Harry, and Tom, what's your name, pet? Lisa, Elisa, beautiful. Father, tonight I pray blessing, protection on we, Elisa. God, this is not a normal meeting tonight. It's just not. It's a supernatural meeting because your spirit's here. And I pray tonight that you will continue to work in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I've only ever done this song out once before like this and it's been in my head all day. Um, I, I love the story of the prodigal son or maybe more so the prodigal father. The young boy who, well he wrecked his life, he was real good at making a mess, real good at making a mess. And when he found himself asking a similar question, what, what's my life all about? Sitting in a pigsty, no friends, no money, no nothing. Party was over. He asked what his life was about, and he says, I'm going to go back to my father. I'm going to go back. And I can picture him rehearsing a wee prayer as he's going. I can, you know the way you, if you're trying to write a message and you delete it and you type it and you delete it? I can picture him rehearsing what he was going to say. But when he got back, says he was a long way off. When he, when he was far away, his father saw him. And it says he went running to meet him. And he threw his arms around him. And he never got to finish his wee speech. And tonight, tonight, God's arms is open for you. And there's a home for you, a place for you. And maybe, maybe you run away from home. Maybe you drink at home because you hate home. Maybe home's an awful place. God's got a good home for you. And he's inviting you to come. And so we've said before, I'll say it again, we're not really that bothered about the messes that you've made. If it'll help you to talk to us about it, well, we would love to do that. But we're not that bothered with what you've done or what it is that trips you up and ties you up. But if you've wandered far away from God and you're tired of it, then tonight's your night. Tonight's your night to come home. <laughs>
thank you tonight for such a great promise in your word that you have come to give us life and life to the full. And Lord, I pray for anybody who's in here tonight, Lord, anybody who's live with us on Zoom, anybody who's watching this later on, wherever they find the video, and they're living life subpar. They're living life that's miserable. They're living a life that's been wrapped and wasted by the thief who came to kill and to steal and to destroy. Lord, they're, they're living a life where the thief's telling them it would be better if they weren't here. Lord, I pray. Lord, I pray tonight. I pray tonight, God, that they would see that you went to prepare a place for them. Lord, that your arms are open wide. Lord, not arms of judgment, not arms of condemnation, but arms of love tonight. Open wide. Longing for them to come home. So we'll, we'll work the rest of it out later. Just come home. Just come home. Lord, parents in here tonight, that Lord, physically, would you love kids? Lord, they can grasp a wee bit about what you mean because we, we just love them to come home and we, we could work it out later. Lord, I pray that today would be the day of salvation. Lord, give people courage. Give people courage. When the heart near beating out of their chest, Lord, give them to just utter a simple prayer. Lord, save them. Lord, I thank you that you're faithful. Lord, that whoever would call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That is the oh, Lord, come and move and work in our midst, I pray. Lord, work in homes. Lord, we thank you that you're not tied to one place, but Lord, you can meet somebody in the sofa. Lord, you can meet somebody just lying on their face in the living room. Lord, crying their eyes out. Lord, you can meet somebody watching this in a week's time. Lord, move by your spirit, we pray. Lord, we love you. We love you. We thank you for a simple message of hope, for a message of good news. In his name of Jesus, we pray that people would meet you tonight. Lord, take us home safely, we pray. Lord, bless us. Keep your hand upon us, we ask. Lord, go before us into tomorrow night. Lord, make it a great night for your kingdom, we pray. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.